Hello, everyone. My guest today is Jason Janowitz. He is the one of the co-founders of a group called Blockworks Group. They founded it back in 2017, and they produce a ton of events and education podcasts around blockchain and crypto and how it relates to markets. Want to have him on right now for obvious reasons. Jason, you ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. All right. So Bitcoin, you know, we're recording this. What is it today? It's Thursday, April 9th. We're recording. Bitcoin price was down to 3,800, call it a week, two weeks ago. It's now back up to call it 7,300 on the same day that the Federal Reserve and the government is announcing another $2 trillion pumped into the economy. Give us some context here. How do you see crypto and Bitcoin in general playing into market fears and a growing federal balance sheet amid the coronavirus crisis? Yeah, great, great question, Nathan. Um, I think before diving into crypto and Bitcoin, you kind of have to actually zoom out. So you have to look at like, uh, number one, you have to look at what caused the financial situation, right? Then once you understand what caused the situation, you can dive into what is the current situation, right? And what is the current hole that we're in right now? Once you figure that out, you can talk about what, what's the solution to the hole. Once you figure out what the solution to, you know, and when I say solutions, like what is the Fed going to do? What do they think the solution is? Once you figure that out, you can figure out where to deploy capital. Then once you figure out you know, where people are deploying capital, then I think you can start to talk about Bitcoin. But without understanding the other stuff, I think, I think Bitcoin, it's not, it's not part of the, the conversation without understanding the other stuff. Let's go into it, top to bottom, start at the top. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, just number one, like what caused the financial situation? You've, you had an economy that was running at three and a half times leverage, most leverage in history. You had asset prices across the board at the highest PE, price to earning levels ever. You had, this is a wild one, you had pre-tax corporate profits in the US hadn't grown in like, I don't know, five, six, seven years, right? But the, but the market had doubled, right? Because of corporate buyback. So, so the market was kind of priced for perfection for one of these things. A lot of people make, making a lot of money, but assets were just way overpriced. So, that, so that's number one. Once you understand that, then you can talk about like, okay, so then this weird thing called coronavirus comes along, wipes out the economy and the economy and the stock market are so intertwined. So like, uh, so that's what's causing what's happening right now. So coronavirus comes along, globalization stops, supply chains stop, uh, people stop going to the grocery store, things like that. We get a stock market decline of 35%, right? The, the fastest decline in history. Once you, once you kind of look at that, I think the question becomes... Um, what's the hole, right? And when I say the hole, it's like, what's the hole in the US GDP or the global GDP? Um, so, and, and this is changing, right? Like I'm sure you've seen, you just called out the $2 trillion Fed stimulus package. Um, three weeks ago, the hole was, was 500 billion. Then it was a trillion. Then it was 2 trillion. Then 5 trillion. People, like, people were saying the GDP was going down 6%. Then, then someone said 12%. Then You're talking mentioned. global GDP or US, G, G, US GDP? I'm, I'm talking US GDP. So like yeah. gold, right? And then Goldman came out and said GDP was going to fall 25%. Morgan Stanley comes out and says 30%. James Bullard of the Fed says 50%, right? So, so, these, so then you start to get some like crazy, crazy Great Depression-like numbers. So, so let's start there. So let, let's call it 25%. Let's say Goldman, Goldman's right. So the US... Uh, what US GDP is 19 trillion. Let's round up to 20 trillion because I'm bad at math. Let's say uh, Goldman's wrong, or excuse me, Goldman's right. GDP falls 25%. Well, 25% of 20 trillion, you're looking at a $5 trillion hole in the mm -hmm. US economy. So, I mean, I mean that's a night, nightmare, right? So $5 trillion hole. Then it becomes, we know the size of the hole, it's 5 trillion. Then it becomes how quickly can you fill that hole? So you look back, so then we start to look back at some, I was a history major in college, right? So I can geek out on history stuff. But like you look at other crises and see how quickly we fill holes. And you've got like the IRA in 2008, 2009 took 60 days to send checks out. Uh, the ECB with like corporate bond buying program took 90 days to, to uh, you know, to fill that, to, you know, to start buying bonds. Well, in this situation, we don't have that kind of time, right? We don't like... 16, uh, we're recording this, what's the date? April 9th? Thursday, yeah, April 9th. Yeah, April 9th. This morning, the new, new unemployment numbers came 16, out. 16, 16 million, right? 16 million unemployed in three weeks. Three yep. weeks, that's, that's more than we're unemployed in the global financial crisis. By, but not, not by a little, by like a factor by a lot. of a lot. <laughs> yeah, so like two, two years, global financial crisis, more unemployed in three weeks. So what we're seeing is we don't have time. Time is creating its own risk here. So. 
Um, so that's so that's a really important thing to note. Then it becomes um, what what's actually happening because that's what's happening in the economy. Well, what's happening in the market, right? And you're seeing it. You just saw a huge liquidity crisis, um, which is basically uh, asset prices start going down. People people don't really want to sell, but they get margin calls. You're talking physical assets or the hedge funds that are overexposed and over levered. I'm just margin calls. Like, yeah, asset prices and and the big institutional investors. So whether you're you're a hedge fund, pension, endowment, who you know, you name it. Probably most of most of these guys are the hedge funds, right? They're getting margin called, and in a margin call, you have to sell assets, and you have to sell. You, you they hold liquid assets and illiquid assets. They have to sell their liquid assets, right? So stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. People are dumping stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities, and what do they move into? They're they're moving into the U.S. dollar. Right, because that's what you know. That's what these assets are priced are priced in, and that creates. And I promise, this is all tying back to Bitcoin. That creates a deflationary environment, right? Which is really bad. And to stop the deflationary environment, the dollar has to stop gaining strength. The only way to reverse the trend of the dollar gaining strength is to flood the market with massive amounts of dollars, and that's what we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. So. So that was a little bit of a tangent, but like, <laughs> well, so I've, and by the way, we don't have to get to Bitcoin immediately. We can save that for later. Cause I want to get the current picture first. Right. So let me, there's a lot of stuff that we just went over. Let me, let me go back first and talk about, uh, in the U S uh, GDP to debt ratio, just stateside. Right. So you've got call it 20 trillion in GDP. You've also now got about 22 ish trillion, 21 trillion uh, in debt. Right. So you've got essentially 104%, 105% ratio there to make you guys understand that those that are listening, that's for every single person listening. If you're a U.S. citizen, essentially $67,000 in debt against you. And, and we're only producing per person call it 65,000. So if every person listening right now is a balance sheet or a profit and loss statement, we're all underwater. Jason, how do, how do we get out of that? How, how do you, you know, how do you produce your way out of that? Can a stimulus drive additional GDP growth? Um, it can, right. I mean, like, so I, that was a really good point about GDP to debt ratio, right? Like when you look at I think it's important to just remember this is all an experiment and no one knows anything, right? Like we didn't even get off the gold standard until 1971. And like, if you look in the seventies, the GDP to debt ratio is really healthy. It was like, it was in the 30 to 40% ratio, 30 to 40%, right? And then you get to the nineties or the eighties, the thing starts crawling up, right? And the Fed's balance sheet starts crawling up as well, goes up to like 50, 60%. Then 2009, right? GDP to debt was like, I don't know, I should Google this, but like 60, 70%. And now, now you just threw out that crazy number. We're at like 105% now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you asked, you asked like, can, can GDP go up through the stimulus package? Of course. Like that's why you pump money into the economy, but there are, that's why the, the fed does what they do is because it works. Um, well, but doesn't it, so again, I am not a huge, huge economic, it's one of the reasons I want to have you on. Doesn't a stimulus like this only work if the velocity of the, do- so let's say, let's break the, let's ignore 2 trillion for a second. Let's just assume $1 is printed by the Fed and that dollar is given to you via a check, right? It's mailed to every US citizen. If you don't, if you spend that dollar and pay your landlord rent and your landlord then holds that dollar because they're nervous and they want to sit on cash, the money velocity of that dollar that Fed printed is one right? For a year, like doesn't printing money, isn't it hyper reliant on that dollar by that landlord being spent again by the landlord, then again by somebody else four or five times in the economy. So you get $5 of GDP for per dollar of stimulus. And if you don't get that leverage, how does the stimulus work? How do you grow GDP? You completely nailed it. That that's, that's, that's so important. I think people don't understand that. So we, the, the Fed's got a hammer, right? And they, they basically, they, the only thing they know how to do is interest rates, pump money. It's the only, it's the only thing they can do, right? Yep. And so what they've done is the only two things they can do. They've yanked interest rates to zero and they've pumped money into the economy. And that, that actually works unless you have a global health pandemic, which is causing people not to, not causing people, people are not allowed to leave their homes. So in um, 2008, 2009, the pumping money into the economy, that actually worked really well, right? And we got out of, we got out of that recession. Um, why? Because it was, a, it was a financial crisis. 
So people didn't have enough money. You print more money, you give them more money, they go out and spend more money, the economy goes back up. Right now, why this is why I'm so scared is because you can give people all they want, but like I'm I've been locked inside for 27 days right now. So I'm not I, I looked at my credit card bill, it's amazing. I'm not spending any yeah. money. Yeah. But you know who it's not amazing for is every every business in the US. So you you could give me ten thousand dollars right now. You can give me a hundred thousand dollars. I got nowhere to spend it. Therefore, the therefore the GDP and the economy can't go up. Yep. I mean, this is what people mean when they say, and you hear in the press conferences from the government saying we can grow our way out of this. I have a real hard time modeling how people how you grow your way out of this by printing more money because I don't see where the velocity of money comes from. Everyone, there's a shortage of U.S. dollars, so people are going to sit on liquidity. They're going to sit on that dollar, yeah. not spend it. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think what's happening is like you've got you've got, you, it, it's, it's a layered issue. So like, uh, and, and people are honestly seeing like, we just have to take care of human needs right now. Like food, yeah. like I, I, there's no salt in my home right now because Amazon can't send me salt until like a- April 16th. So that, and that's a crazy thing. I've never not had salt in my house. So, um, you have to take care of basic needs right now. And so like w- the first thing we need to take care of is people paying their rent and people getting food. So here's some crazy stats request to delay mortgage payments grew by 1300% between the mark, the week of March 2nd and the week of March 16th and another 1900% in the set in the latter two weeks of March, Mm -hmm. uh, 30, another one, 33% of us apartment renters didn't pay their April rent or excuse me, didn't pay their March rent. Right. That 30, like a third of the U S is not paying their rent right now. So like we need to take care of people's basic needs and then we can start to think about, Oh, how do you take care of, uh, of, and, and take care of like the MTA and like the subways and things like that. Then you can start to think about, okay, how do we take care of like the fashion brands and like the retailers and things like that? Mm -hmm. Well, so before we progress, like, and, and keep going through like current day and then where we see the future going, uh, the fed cuts interest rates to zero to try and solve an issue that is arguably not an economic one. Was that a bad move in the sense that they are giving up dry powder that they could use in the future for an actual financial crisis? No. Um, because this is an actual financial crisis. This is the greatest financial crisis that we've seen since the great depression. This is, this is a massive, massive, massive deal. Um, and, there are, there are only like, this is what we're doing right now. The, let me, let me back up there, are, there. The fed can do things and the government can do things, right? So the fed can like pull interest rates back and pump money into the economy. They're doing that and they should be doing it. But what I think wall street doesn't understand, like stocks are rebounding, but that, that's foolish. Stocks are going to tank again, oh, 100%. Um, w- the reason why is because the government's not doing enough. And what the government can do is they can't print money. They can't lower interest rates, but they can give relief packages. So they can make it so that rent is not due in the United States for the rest of 2020. They can make it so corporate taxes go down to 5%. They can make it so my taxes aren't 30 to 40%, but 10% Mm -hmm. personal income taxes. So things like that need to be done. um, And that's the only way that we're going to get out of this. Well, so Jason, let me go through those two points and then do the caveat. Okay. So you, you put rent on hold. Great. Now all the landlords are essentially now are taking the hit. They have debt payments because they, they, they got a big loan to buy the property in the first place. Number two, you take up corporate tax rates down to 5%. Well, guess what? Now the federal government has less income. So now we're going to go into like, who's going to pay for the stimulus is that they're, they're running, right? Like how do you balance these things? I mean, you're making me happy. I'm not in charge of the fed right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know is the real question, but like, I just think, no, I, I, I don't know is the answer, but I think mm-hmm. that there are, I mean, here's one of the problems. The Fed, like when the Fed does these buyback programs and, um, you know, gives money to the banks and, th- and things like that, or excuse me, tries to give money to small businesses, they're not set up to give money to individuals and small businesses. So like, uh, we just saw, I don't, I don't know if your business applied for PPP. It sounds like you guys are doing really well right now, but like we applied for for PPP, just like all other small businesses I, that I know. Um, we couldn't, we had to go through our bank, right? JP Morgan to get that, to get PPP. Why? Because the fed is not set up to give you and me and our small businesses 
the money directly. So there's just a, there's so many inefficiencies, um, and we're just not set up for something like this. Mm-hmm. So everyone's answer seems to be print more money, right? When does this break? Like when does the idea of like we can just keep printing money to get ourselves out of all problems? When does this come back and smack us in the face and really we go, oh my gosh, this is not a solution anymore? I think now. Um, yeah, I think now. So like if we look at once you've, so we, so what we did at the beginning of this conversation, right, we figured out the hole, right? We called it $5 trillion. Um, then what the fed is doing is they're, they're printing money and, and everything's on the table right now. It's crazy. Like we're going from impossible situations to implausible situations to like, Oh my God, this is the reality now. Mm -hmm. And like, and we're, it's, it's jump risk, right? It's the risk that things can happen like overnight and you just don't understand how fast things can happen. So like March 4th, um, we had this eight and a half billion dollar coronavirus package. That was, that was a month. That was five weeks ago. Like we, when I remember, you probably remember like five weeks ago, we're like eight and a half billion. Oh my God. Well then two weeks later, a $2 trillion stimulus package comes out and we're like, and, and that makes the billion seem irrelevant. And then today, April 9th, another 2 trillion, over 2 trillion, $2.3 trillion Fed lending program comes out. But here's the issue. And this ties to what you just said. When does this end? I, I think it starts to end now. Uh, what does that look like? What, what, what metric are you looking at? It says, oh, it's ending now. Now's the time. Well, let's think about where, where's that money coming from, right? It's not, it's not, it, you're print, the Fed's printing it out of thin air. So what, what you've got is a situation. So, th- so then it starts to get into like, where do you deploy capital? And, and what this is, is you have to look at the second order impacts of printing all this money and it's inflation. And in some situations, like, there are other countries, third world and first world countries that have done what we're doing, which is printing money. And it quickly spirals out of control and becomes hyperinflation, mm-hmm. right? Like inflation is just like crack. Like you can give a, you can give a, you can give a drug user like a little hit, which is like our stimulus. And we're like, Ooh, that was nice. Like, you know, the stimulus worked out pretty well. Let's do like a little bit more, a little bit more. All right, well, now you're hooked on crack. You're a daily crack user. Same thing as, in, as a stimulus package. You're like, oh, let me, let me give a little stimulus. Let me print a little bit of money. Let me print a little more. Let me print a little more. Oh my God, now we have crazy hyperinflation. It's so, like for people listening right now, what does that mean? They go try and buy milk and milk is now 20 bucks a gallon? It basically means your dollar is worth less. Like if there are, if there are a total of $100 in the market um, and you print 100 more dollars, well, now your dollars are, yeah, your dollars are worth, are worth less. So like, let's, here, here's an actual way to look at it. The, um, so yeah, on a consumer level, it just means pri- like prices start rising rapidly and your, the value of your, of your dollar is worth less. But in terms of re- like what's actually happening, the Federal Reserve balance sheet has gone from uh, every five years, right? These are five year increments. It was 200 billion, then it was 350 billion, 450 billion, 600 billion, 800 billion. So rising a little, a little, then it was 2 trillion. Now, then it was 4 trillion. And I think we're, we'll be at $10 trillion, right? On the Fed's balance sheet, which is basically the amount of money that's in the economy right now. Yeah. Yeah. You break, you broke 2 trillion, obviously with, with 2008. And now you see the line just basically going vertically straight up. And you, you're bringing up a point, which I feel, which is anyone that has worked really hard over the past decade, two, three decades or more and saved money. And you're sitting on liquidity. Basically every dollar you've saved, you could argue is now worth 50 cents because of how essentially the balance sheet has doubled. Um, and so again, what I'm trying to get at is what is that moment when you say this all hits us in the face for a listener right now? Like I want them to think I listened to Nathan's podcast. I went into the store. I saw that like toilet, well, not toilet paper is a bad example. But food is now triple what it usually costs. My cereal is triple what it usually costs. Jason was right. This is the moment inflation is hitting. I feel it. Like, is that it? Is it grocery prices or the roof? <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I, but I think what it is is when, when this doesn't, I I, I really don't know is the real answer, Mm -hmm. but I think it's just, it's so, so, so important to remember that we're only, uh, 1971, we're only 49 years into this experiment Mm -hmm. of like 1971, Richard Nixon takes the U S off of the gold standard says in his press conference, we're going to go back on it. This is temporary obviously it wasn't temporary, right? We've been 49 years where the U S dollar is 
It used to be backed by gold. It's not backed by anything. Mm -hmm. It's backed by the, the faith in the government. So look, while there's like less than a five, 10% chance that this happens, it's a non-zero possibility that this 49 year experiment ends up not working out. Right. And it's, and I think the fiat currency experiment is most vulnerable to failure when an, when an economy gets addicted to monetary stimulus. Um, and the stimulus is merely, it's the, it's the long-term devaluation of a currency and you can't, you can't devalue a currency forever. Right. And right now we are, we're the, we're the crack addict. We're the stimulus addict devaluing our currency forever. Many would argue and say, Jason, I hear you. But one of the nice things uh, is, is much of the worldwide debt is backed against the U S dollar. So because we are the global currency that a lot of the foreign, these foreign countries debt is, you know, up against, we have a little bit of a cushion. There's others that will say, well, Nathan, take a look at like Chile, for example, right? Their, their dollar debt, right? As a percent of GDP, right? Call it 39, 40%, right? Their foreign exchange reserves as a percent of GDP is only like 17, 18%. What that means mm -hmm. is if they want to basically get, you know, US dollars, right? Some liquidity, there isn't enough US dollars worldwide. So they have to sell US based assets, right? To try and cash them. If they sold all their assets, it wouldn't make up for the person, their dollar debt, right? As a percent of their GDP. So you're going to, people are arguing, you're going to end up seeing a sovereign debt crisis. And what happens when a, you know, a country like Chile enters a sovereign debt crisis, Turkey is also in this category, right? What happens when these countries basically are completely out of money. The U S dollar, obviously there's, there's a shortage. What happens to these folks? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a good point. Like I, so, so here's the problem, right? In the U S half, half the U S owns equities. Half the U S doesn't own equities. A number might be like 55, 45 or 50, 50, something like that. But let's call it half the U S owns equities. Half the U S doesn't own equities. Well, if you take the, the kind of the, the lower class. I don't know if there's a more politically right, correct way to say that, but like who doesn't own equities when you get a ton of inflation or excuse me, when you get a ton of like stimulus, well, the, the equity market's going to pump. It's not just, I, I you know, I think Bitcoin's going to go up. I think gold's going to go up, but I think the equity market's going to absolutely rip, but because that's what the government knows how to stimulate. Exactly. And yeah, and you could, you know, and then interest rates are at zero, uh, companies start, issuing more and more debt, like Slack yesterday. I, 750 billion. I yeah, million. I didn't know if you saw that. 750 uh, billion. It was a million, million, sorry. Million, excuse me, million, yeah. million at a half percent interest rate. And like, you, you just get companies can start doing whatever they want to increase their asset prices. Um, like app, like you could see like uh, Slack, hypothetically, if they wanted to, could issue... Um, or a really any public, any public company could issue debt at super low interest rates and then use that, the money that they got to buy back their stock. And by the way, not just that, like even private Airbnb just did a billion, same day as yesterday exactly. as, as, as Slack did it. Money. Yeah. 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 But, but still a lot of that was, a, it's a debt deal. Um, yeah. it's like, it could have been way worse actually, uh, if it was a pure equity deal, because obviously they're you're taking a huge hit right now. But so, so Again, where, to, so just to summarize your point, you know, 326 million Americans, you know, less than 180 of million of them actually own some, you know, airline stock or restaurant stock or whatever equities, right? What you're saying is when the, when the federal government or the, or the or fed or the government stimulates the economy, what they're actually stimulating in many cases are, are some of these equities, right? They decide to bail out a bank. The bank stock goes up. They decide United Airlines can't fail. They buy that. All those stock shoots up. People that own those equities make money. Where does that leave the 126 million people that do not participate in the equity market? It leaves them pissed off and it leaves them more. It, it, it increases the wealth, the, in, the income inequality gap even more, right? Because you have, you have individuals whose dollars are decreasing in value and they don't own any equities, right? Which are increasing in value. So really just net net, they're, they're, they're losing on all sides of this operation. Um, and look, I'm, I'm not, I, I want to be, I want to be careful in saying that, like, I'm not like a tin hat guy where like tin foil hat guy where like, I think this is all going to blow up. The U S has been the leader of the free world for a really long time. All I'm saying is that doesn't make us immune to mistakes, right. Or missteps. And that this is just this, this fiat 
experiment that we're on right now is it's a 49 year experiment. And we've, we've seen other countries weaken their currency to the point of hyperinflation, Zimbabwe, Venezuela. I'm just saying we have to be really careful right now because it's, it's, it's contentious. And I think we're going down a very dangerous path right now. Uh, as a percent of GDP, uh, how much debt would the U.S. essentially have to issue or be on the, you know, the, the, the government's balance sheet before we start to see hyperinflation? China, over the past couple of years, you've actually seen about 300% in terms of debt to GDP ratio. We're only at, call it 100, 405%. Like, when does the system break? Um, or how, I, should, I, should ask, I should maybe ask, how do you think about when the system breaks? No one knows when it would break, right? But Yeah, um... When, like, what happens when the system breaks? I mean, like, so, so this ties really nicely into Bitcoin, right? Like, what, what happens is people look for other options and they look for alternatives and they get out of the current, like, the current um, financial ecosystem that we're in right now, right? It's, it's, it's almost no different than, um, let's take, like, this, this is kind of a weird analogy. We'll see if this works. Like, on prem software, right? You're a SaaS guy. So, like, on prem software, was was the only option in like the 90s and the, like the early 2000s but then things like uh salesforce come around and it's just a better it's just a better overall experience and it just is a um it's it's just a better option so i think why i'm so bullish on bitcoin one of the many reasons right is it's a it's sound money it's a better asset it's not malip- manipulatable it's not seizable it's not censorable it's not debasable over time, people are going to tr- choose a currency that the government does not control. That's my thesis. So let's go back for a second. Um, let's let's call there's two classes of people: the wealth class that participate in equities in the states, and the ones that don't. People that have no stocks, right? Um, anyone that is participating in equities um, potentially loves this time. They say we've been on a bull market for 11 years. Things are finally uh, with deflationary, right? We we can now buy stuff for cheap, and then the government even bails things out, and we get nice juice there. They don't necessarily want to move off government currency because they have an unfair advantage in that they already participate in equities, and they know the Fed's going to back that stuff for. For somebody that, um, I'll be this example, I'll cast myself as this example. Uh, let's say I was a college student, graduated with some debt, had a job, you know, was, you know, making 60,000 bucks a year. I just got laid off that job and I have no stock, right? I can, I'm barely, you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I'm not getting that surge in equities because I don't have any stocks. Um, how, how does that person even start thinking about, oh, there's a thing called Bitcoin. Let me go like figure out how to buy my milk using hmm. Bitcoin, right? And like, like, how do you get that 126 million not participating in US equities on an alternative system like Bitcoin? It ha- it, Bitcoin was, is interesting because I've, I've, I've you know, kind of been following the space since um, there are a lot, a lot of people have been doing it a lot longer than me, right? But I, I got into the space in 2015. Um, I was living in kind of Budapest, Hungary, actually. And uh, a lot of the students out there love Bitcoin and, and started kind of looking into it then. Um, it's been interesting to see because like 2015, 2016, 2017, like 2017, if you remember the market ripped, that was a consumer, that was a retail led uh, pump in the price of Bitcoin. But what needs to happen for like mainstream adoption and for this asset class to ever, it's like what, 100 billion dollar asset class. It's, it's tiny. It's microscopic. Nobody uses Bitcoin. I, I'm well aware of that. It's a speculative asset right now. I'm very well aware of that. Um, what needs to happen is mainstream is institutional folks need to, need to allocate to this asset class. And I'm betting that they will not be, not actually because I don't think a hedge fund manager, I don't think you're going to have a 70 year old gray haired family office man or woman say, Oh my God, I need to get out of the U S dollar. Right. I'm like, I hate the U S dollar. I need to go into Bitcoin. What you're going to have is you're going to say, you're going to have these folks saying, I need to hedge against the U I need to hedge against our current system because we are in a system that they see completely falling apart. And so they need to, what they're going to do is they're going to allocate 1%, 2% to Bitcoin. What that does is when you get Yale's endowment 
Harvard's endowment, CalPERS pension fund, the pension fund of the police of New York, the Bill Ackman's hedge fund, Ray Dalio, when you get those folks buying Bitcoin, that's when the prices start to come up again. And we know that more and more people come into the Bitcoin ecosystem when the price goes up. Mm-hmm. Ignoring the speculative side though, right? Just from a Bitcoin is decentralized, it's not controlled by central power, it can't be devalued, right? Through a stimulus, right? When does that college student in Atlanta, Georgia, right? Who like, I get the hedge fund thing. I get the speculative side. I get that from like a monetary policy and a returns perspective. Yeah. But don't you at some point have to get these masses to understand how debt works, which is not easy by the way, <laughs> right? And once they understand that their dollars that they did save, the hundred bucks they did save in their bank over the past year are now worth $50 because of how the Fed is printing money. Like how do you make them have an aha moment and say, oh my gosh, money's worthless. I need to go look at an alternative. It's a great question. Um, let me go a little more qualitative than quantitative here in the response. Um, and we'll, we'll see if you accept it. Uh, there's about to be a massive... By the way, I don't know. I'm a, this is a riff. <laughs> like the SaaS world, I can ask questions and I can, I can set up traps and do gotchas. This is like a different yeah. format for me. So I don't know the answer either. <laughs> great. That makes two of us. So yeah. you're about to see a massive transference of wealth, right? Um, Every day you've got tens of thousands of folks who turn 71 and a half years old or whatever. They get their money out of their retirement. And, um, and then, you know, sadly, 10, 10, 20 years later, they pass away. That money goes down and passes down to their kids, right? And to their grandchildren. Let me, let me ask you, let's talk about that college kid who's in Georgia or whatever, the, the person you just mentioned. Yep. They... Before, from, these are from qualitative conversations with dozens of folks. Right. I'm, I'm only 26. I just turned 26. So I'm still, I'm still talking to the college folks as crazy yeah. as that is. They are all buying Bitcoin. They, they, they don't, they have no idea what TD Ameritrade is. They have no idea what Charles Schwab is. They don't know what E-Trade is. They don't know what a brokerage is. They're buying their, they're buying their stocks through Robinhood and Cash App, right? What else does Robinhood and Cash App offer? Bitcoin front and center. Why? Because they understand that millennials view Bitcoin as an asset class. Mm -hmm. So I just think like, you know, there's always harm in being too early and we could be too early here, but like I just, this is coming to be a perfect storm where you've got like at the highest levels, the Fed just completely fucking up and just like has no, no one has any idea what to do. It's not that they're fucking up. It's just no one has any idea what to do. The economy's going to the shitter, the global, you know, we have a global health pandemic. Plus, you've got a massive transference of wealth of trillions of dollars going from old folks to millennials. And we know one thing, which is millennials love Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. To your point, Robinhood, Wealthfront, that also feature an easy way to you know, get into Bitcoin. These are also, though, people that are part of the 126 million that already participate in the equity markets. That's why they have Robinhood in the first place. right? Like What I'm trying to really figure out, and whether it's Bitcoin or some other alternative asset class, there has to be a moment when... And it's going to be a mar it's more of a marketing thing. It's more of a PR thing where people realize, holy crap, the, the dollar now is worthless. Like there has to be this kind of moment. Look, I don't know. I mean, when you do the math, right? Let's assume Goldman is right. I'm taking your numbers here and that there is a 20% decline in GDP. So we go from 20 trillion down to 15 trillion. And we're talking about a Fed balance sheet that's quickly approaching eight, nine, 10 trillion. You now have the American government is 70 to 80% of the total GDP you're a socialist country. I mean, at that, if that continues, you're a socialist country, right? So like, I wonder if there is some moment where that kind of narrative hits mainstream media and people start really looking for these alternatives. Yeah. I, I think what you're looking for is like one moment in time. And it, it's the same thing I've done. I like, I've, I've said like, I want once Ray Dalio buys Bitcoin and comes out publicly, this thing's going to rip. Once an endowment buys Bitcoin, this thing's going to rip. Once X, Y, and Z happen, Bitcoin's going to rip. I'm coming to learn that's not how this world works, right? So I think it's just a, it's everything coming together. And so let's take, um, let's take something that's kind of crazy that's happening is these bailouts, right? We're like, I don't, I don't know about you, but like I've, you know, when I played sports growing up, it was like you, you play to win, Right the losers get off the field right now 
there, there are no losers. We're, we're basically saying to companies that, are, that didn't handle their cash properly, that didn't save for the future, we're saying to CEOs that completely screwed up the financials of their company, you know what, you know what, Nathan, it, it's okay. Here, here's, a, here's a billion dollars. Here's $10 billion. Oh, you're United, right? The government's literally saying to United, we're going to bail you out. And United, is this, their CEO is negotiating, right? He's saying, you can bail me out, but I don't, I don't want you to take an equity stake in my company. That's crazy that these companies are going under and, and being able to negotiate. Well, right, that's not capitalism, that's cronyism. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's, it's, it's everything coming together. I, um, we were talking E-Trade, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade like five minutes ago. The Charles Schwab put out an interesting report. It was like, it showed the baby boomers, their top 10 holdings, Gen X, their top 10 holdings, and millennials, their top 10 holdings. Well, in the top 10 holdings, for all three of those classes, you had Amazon, you had Apple, you had Berkshire, ha- or you had Facebook, and Microsoft. Millennials, though, in their top five holdings, hold the, gray, the grayscale Bitcoin trust, whereas baby boomers and Gen X hold Berkshire Hathaway, right? So it's just like, it's all of this stuff coming together um, that, that I think it's a longer term thing. It's not like one moment in time. In my yeah. Mind. No, no, I, I, I get that. I mean, look, so I've, I'm spending a lot of time thinking of this, trying to formulate my thoughts into like a easy way to communicate it. And like one truth that I think, like I try and find like Lego blocks they are going to be true no matter what. And I think you're going to see, like, if you think what's happened in the past four years politically is bad, I think you're going to see 10 times that in terms of class warfare. If the government continues to bail out companies without giving the average American equity in the company. Yeah. So, so like that is actually, that is my current best solution to how you get the 50% of Americans that don't participate in equities participating in equities. They have to have some of that upside. The United CEO should not be negotiating. The government should be saying, no, we're taking 30% of the company and we're taking a part of that 30%, like almost like a employee option pool, right? At a startup, we're taking a portion of the 30% that we're buying to bail you out and we're distributing it evenly among 326 million Americans. That way, the next time United gets bailed out and the stock price jumps, that person that is in Georgia that didn't, wasn't in equity before actually gets some of that increase in value. Yeah, no, look, I, I think, I think you're right, but I like, I don't know too much about this. I don't want to dive too deep, but like what there's a world where you could see us having to go back to things like, um, like pensions, right. Where like, or like where every American who works for a company, like ends up getting, Actually, that's a bad idea. Never mind. I take that back. Yeah, I don't know. Like, so and you pensions are bankrupts, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I was, well, so that's why I didn't go down that path is because yeah. pensions, like, they've there's a massive issue in pensions. Right, they now. might be they, part of the bailout, actually. Yeah, exactly. So that's. that's why I mean, I, I think I think part <laughs> of I think so. Like the other the other thing you can do is people will say, well, Nathan, you've got to figure out how to tax the company sitting on a bunch of cash. But when you look at cash positions at some of these companies, right? Even in Q4 2019, Microsoft 136 billion, Berkshire Hathaway 128 billion, Alphabet 121 billion, Apple 100 billion. Even if you took all of that money, it doesn't barely even make a dent in the $20 trillion deficit. Okay, maybe you get, maybe you get, you know, a trillion, fine, a trillion out of 20 trillion, right? It's, it's just, it's 5%. It just, it's not a solution to solve the problem. So like, like what I'm hunting for in these conversations with people I'm talking to are like the economic, social, you know, and political ramifications of, you know, the stimulus, you know, you specifically because of what you focus on at Blockworks is what does it mean for alternative asset classes? What, by the way, am I missing any? Should I be asking you about other alternative asset classes besides Bitcoin and crypto? Um, no, no. Okay. Um, I mean like, look, like, uh, I think things like any, any inflationary hedge is going to do well, like gold will do well as well, but like, it's just, uh, it doesn't have the potential appreciation that that's something like Bitcoin does. Yeah. Are you seeing in any, let's go back to some of these, uh, countries we talked about where again, uh, the debt they have, the, the dollar debt as a portion of their GDP, uh, they cannot cover that with their foreign exchange reserves as a percent of their GDP. So, you know, they potentially are going to be looking for alternative assets, you know, to put, maybe their standard on before the U S will. So like, let's look at Chile, for example, are you seeing any movements inside of any of these kind of foreign, uh, kind of emerging market companies where there is real momentum towards an alternative currency because of, again, they're basically broke. 
Yeah, I, I think what you're going to have is you're, you're going to have countries that need to start over, right? And uh, so like Japan, um, anyone, anyone from like very first world countries, like a Japan has like a debt to GDP ratio of like 250%, right? Greece, which obviously is in the shitter and has been for a while, 180%. Like anyone from Lebanon, Italy, uh, Portugal, Singapore, Mozambique, like these are countries that just have, it, it really ranges on the scope of where they are in like the global economic status. But they have one thing in common, which is they have way more debt. Their debt to GDP ratio is like out of control. So again, like I don't want to sound too conspiracy theorist here, but like this is a time when... Uh, if you want to, if you want to go into some crazy theories here, like what you what you could see happen, yeah, say, give me crazy. We like crazy. Let's go crazy. Like, here's something that could happen. We, uh, we 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 pause the stock market for a little, right? Because like we're going eight percent swing, five percent swing. If the market starts tanking again, there are circuit breakers in place that prevent uh, the stock market going down. Um, but if say you keep having these like five to ten percent declines, you could basically the Fed or the U.S. or whoever owns the stock market, whatever, could basically just say we're pausing the stock market. And this this has happened before. It's not it won't be the like after nine eleven, right? We we closed the stock market for a week. The stock market is so closely intertwined with the banking system that what you could see is uh, a well, let me zoom out. The Fed is really helping large banks right now, right? Like the Fed, when they give money and pump money into the economy, they help folks like JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, things like that. Um, who they don't help are small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, excuse me, small and medium-sized banks. So what I think could happen is you end up getting a government seizure of a lot of these small and medium-sized banks. So that's basically the government taking over most of the banks in the country at the same time, the stock market could close. Now, what do you have when the stock market's closed? People can't sell their assets. Meets a government seizure of all these banks. You could renationalize the dollar, and you could basically re, you could you could basically re-denominate the dollar. Um, and now, this is a crazy theory that I haven't really <laughs> formed too much, but you could basically uh, go to bed with a hundred dollars in your bank account, wake up, and you could have. 10, I don't know, followers, right? It's a new currency in your bank account. What that would allow is all the debt, the US dollar denominated debt could be wiped off our books. Mm -hmm. So they're like, and look, that's a 0.01% chance of happening, but like we're seeing jump risk right now. We're seeing, we're seeing that anything is possible. And so you just, you just, you want to, you want to hedge. That's the biggest thing. What, what, so what does that mean? If they, if a new currency is invented and you wake up one morning and now you don't have a hundred dollars, you have 10 something else. I mean, how does that impact, you know, other countries that hold the, you know, U S debt? Um, how does that impact our place in the world? You know, politically, I have no idea how it impacts our debt. Um, but I think in terms of like how it impacts our place in the economy, one of the things that's happening right now that seems pretty clear to me is just like the global order is changing, right? This is the first, this is the first global crisis we've ever had in like a G zero world, right? We have just an absence of glo global leadership right now. And I think the world order is going to look a lot different after coronavirus. Who wins? So, who won? Who wins? Yeah. China wins. And Th that this was not like this wasn't the case after 9-11 in the financial crisis like after both of those the u.s stepped up right the u.s like had everyone else's back but this is um it, a like we're just feeling it's very deglobalized because we have to be right like we, we can't travel and things like that but china it seems like is becoming more and more powerful you have um like u.s u.s entrepreneurs and u.s um billionaires are not doing too much besides just being like, all right, I'll donate, you know, a billion dollars, which is, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with that or a hundred, not a billion, a hundred million dollars. But folks like Jack Ma in China are donating like masks, they're building factories, things like that. I think China is seen as have, you know, even though Trump is calling it the China virus, right? China is seen as having one of the best responses to this and are responsible for the medicine and the supplies that that are going to the, the, the U S and Europe, right? Like U S and Europe are 
entirely dependent on China giving us supplies right now. That's very, very different than America leading the, the global world order after 9-11 and 2008. Then you also have like, we're already going into another cold war with like this 5G stuff and Huawei. Um, and you see what they're doing in Europe. They're, they're giving so, so, so much. Whereas the US, like our hands are tied right now. Mm-hmm. So let me, like the counter argument, we're seeing images this morning, Wuhan is finally opening and people are fleeing. They want nothing to do with it. They're leaving. Alternatively, many large countries that feel like they are stuck right now because their old supply chains for PPE and masks are based in China because that's where it was the cheapest produced labor are now saying, you know what? We can't do that. We have for, for things that we absolutely need in a health crisis, whether it's food, certain seeds, grain, rice, PPE, whatever, uh, we are going to demand that those companies move their supply chains out of China and put them in our own country so this never happens again. So I believe you're going to see a mass exodus of a lot of companies uh, who used to have supply chains in China moving out of China. I think you're going to see China's GDP get hit very, very hard from this. How do they win from this? So let's see. So a lot, a lot of people are leaving China and stuff like that. China is, it, it's important to remember, like things are not all and well and good in China, right? They're, they're 17% of our global economy, but they're, I mean, they're a poor, poor middle income country um, outside of the, the creme de la creme, the top, they're authoritarian, they're a state capitalist country that guarantees greater risk for things like this. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, th- I think when it comes to China, like they, we've just seen what they can do. Like they can move much quicker than us. They've got everything set up for like a response for a global pandemic like this. And there's just like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a liberal Democrat through and through, right? Like I, I love, you know, but, but like you're seeing a capitalist system or excuse me, an authoritarian system, like being able to move really, really quickly. And I think a lot of the Western world is a little shocked by how slowly we're forced to move because mm-hmm. of our politics right now. And that stuff is scary. The now, tricky I, question about that is, are we getting accurate data out of China or is they, or have they created this image like they did move quickly and suppress this thing and they actually haven't, right? And this is like a tricky question too. We don't know what data to rely on. Yeah, we don't. We don't. I would say, I mean, you're right. Like I've, we have absolutely no idea. Um, Part of my fear with this whole thing happening is one of the, like where I would give China credit here, but it's weird. And I'll tell you why, you know, they have this massive network of cameras that can do things and they have the, basically give every citizen a, a community score. Like if they throw trash down, mm-hmm. these sensors yeah. pick it up and they ding their score a bit. Well, you can use this, this same surveillance system they have can be done to like, see if someone is sick walking outside that should be quarantined. Right. And then they can ding their social score, right. If they're out, you know, and when they shouldn't be, cause they're carrying the virus. So they have this network, which removes all privacy from citizens, by the way, but allows them to shut things down like a pandemic very quickly. One of my fears with this is that you see authoritarian governments around the world use the fear created by coronavirus to implement very aggressive surveillance programs in the name of stopping the next pandemic, which can then, it's just too easy to use with surveillance systems for very nasty things. And you might even, by the way, you might even see this here in the States and the, you know, we had the Patriot Act after 9-11, which allowed the government to tap cell phones. You're going to see potentially a biometric version of the Patriot Act uh, come into place here in the States, at least be proposed by somebody. Uh, 100%. Not just, but, but here's the scary thing. That data already exists, right? So it's not, so I think a lot of people are scared. Like the media headlines are like, oh my God, we're going to get a tracker on us. We already have a damn tracker. It's called your cell phone. Yeah. Right? So there, there are companies that have this data. Now, thankfully, the companies are actually, you know, they don't share it with the government very much. Like a- Apple's actually pretty good with their privacy. Some like Google, maybe a little worse. But what could happen is an executive order is signed, right? I wouldn't put it past anyone right now. Um, in the government to basically say, look, executive order, you have to hand over that data or we're shutting you down. If I'm Trump, I do that in two seconds. Why not? Why not? Why not? Right? You've got everyone's an scared like November. everyone's scared like crazy right now. You've got an election coming up in November. What do you need for to get reelected? You need a good economy. What do you need for a good economy? You need the coronavirus to get stopped and people go back to work. What's the best way to get to stop coronavirus? You start tracking people who have coronavirus and understand if they're actually quarantining or leaving their house. 
really wouldn't put it past anyone here. And not only that, when you have data like this, though, you can you can put things into practice that look like it's a, to attack coronavirus. But what we'll what you could actually do is if you really want need to win Alabama, you put a quarantine lockdown in certain counties that you know would swing against you, and say you're staying home because there's a coronavirus <laughs> hotspot there. Don't go vote this day. Like the the ways to manipulate and use this data is just it's extremely powerful stuff. It is. I, I do wonder if we will have an election in November. I'll say that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's crazy to think that we, we won't have, what happens is you delay quote unquote, you delay the election in November. It's no different than delaying the gold standard in 1971, right? You, you temporarily pause the gold standard in 1971, never go back to it. You temporarily delay the elections. Don't have another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all of this could happen. We don't know. Right. We none of, none of us know. Uh, so sum <laughs> up. Sum up. This has been a good conversation so far. Sum up where again your specific skill set is really in crypto and alternative kind of asset classes. You know, to your point, there's not going to be one maybe event that just oh my gosh, Bitcoin and crypto are taking off now. But over the next ten years what do you feel like the, the three things are that will likely happen that will lead to more momentum behind crypto? Just name those three things for me. Inflation, the halvening, and, um, and, the, and actually the price being down right now. So, let, so actually, let's talk about those three things. Yeah. Actually, earlier in the conversation, you wanted like one event that could spur a ton of investment into Bitcoin. That event is, we're 30 days away from that event. It's called the halvening. Okay, what is that? I don't know. For, to any listener that doesn't know Bitcoin, that sounds like something from Lord of the Rings happening. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing's basically Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> but no, so Bitcoin is 30 days away from what's called the halvening. It's basically a significant supply shock. Um, so like scarce assets or any currency, right? The US dollar, gold, Bitcoin, there are ways that there's, there's money in the system and then there's money that's entering the system. So with with the US dollar, right? There's money in the system, then the Fed can print more money into the system. With gold, there's money in the system that is in like bank vaults. And then there's the miners with their pickaxes and the big machines getting gold out of the system, out of out of the ground. With Bitcoin, there's something called mining, which like validates the transactions and makes the system run. Um, every four years, so there's the Bitcoin in the in in the flow in the system right now that actually is like in people's hands, there's about 15 and a half Bitcoin, 15 and a half million Bitcoin out there right now. Every uh, 10 minutes, more Bitcoin is released to the miners. Well, what the happening is, is every four years, it's about, it's roughly every four years, the amount that's given out to the miners is cut in half. So what's about to happen in 30 days is the Bitcoin um, having will programmatically cut the daily incoming supply of Bitcoin from 1800 to 900. So, so a good way to think about this for like the non Bitcoin folks out there who are more like finance and like macro folks are when everyone ran to gold in 2009 to, to 2011, after the financial crisis, it would be like having 50% of the gold miners shut down operations. And what this does is it makes a scarce asset even more scarce at one of its most desirable times in history. So, and this seems like, this seems in my mind to be a likely scenario for Bitcoin, right? You've got massive devaluation of the US dollar. You've got investors moving to seek sound money properties and half the daily incoming supply is going to vanish, right? So unless you're, unless you're expecting a 50% drop in the demand for Bitcoin, then the price should continue to rise because of supply and demand economics, right? This is, it's one of the most understood aspects of Bitcoin, but it's also the thing that presents uh, one of the greatest future economic return potentials. If so, people already know that, and I, I assume the Bitcoin community, this is like common knowledge, isn't that already priced in? Uh, ever, yeah, I, I, in my mind, I think, um, in my mind, I think a lot of folks in the Bitcoin community know it's priced in, but like your, your listeners don't know it's priced in. Yeah. So they all read tech head, they'll read tech headlines that say, Hey, there's half available. And then everyone that you think it's going to drive a rush, which will speculatively drive the price up potentially. Yeah. So, I mean like to maintain, so with the price of Bitcoin, I don't actually even know what it, I've tried not to check it daily, but like, I don't know. 6, 7, 7, 73, 7, There we go. We're coming up. So yeah. to maintain 
a price of 7,000 since uh, the end of 2017, Bitcoin has to have had about $400 million of new cash flow every month, right? So for the last two, two and a half years, every month, about $400 million of new cash has to come into the Bitcoin. Um, after the halvening, we only need about 200 million per month to keep that $7,000 level. Just so, to be clear, real quick, the way you're getting that 400 million is you're taking 1,800 Bitcoins per day times 30 days in a month times 7,000 per Bitcoin to get 400 million per month. Good at math. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, 30 days times 24 hours times six blocks times two and a half Bitcoin per release, basically times 7,000. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so what you're saying is when that, when that drops from 1,800 per day down to 90 per day, uh, you basically need half the amount of cash flow going in to just keep prices consistent at 7,000 a piece. Exactly. So if you, if you need 400 million right now, if you're, you're we're only going to need 200 million. Mm -hmm. If the, what if 400 million continues to pump into the system then should then double the price. price yeah. Yeah. Interest If it's not already priced in. If it's not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Super interesting. Okay. So inflation, the happening in 30 days. And what was the third one? The third one's not really an event in time, but it's basically, it's like, it's the simplest thing. I'm, I'm almost going to like, it's like a duh, right? But like the price has gone down. So the concept of financial returns is, is quite simple. You, sub, you subtract the cost you bought something from the price you sell it. It's not rocket science. Um, uh, like another way to say this is um, you sell an asset at the same price in the future, it would have been better to buy the asset at a lower price initially, right? But again, your listeners are like, Doug, not a genius for saying that. So are you saying cheap prices basically? This is exactly, yeah. Why in my mind, right? This assumes you're bullish on Bitcoin, but like why the outlook for Bitcoin has become exciting over the last 30 days or so, the price has gone down. So mm -hmm. you have the chance for higher return if you believe the Bitcoin thesis is going to work out. So uh, because I know this drives listeners and, and tweets, I'll throw a price target on it. Um, my price target for the next two years um, at a minimum is $20,000. That's at the low end. At the high end, that's $100,000. And break down the $20,000 for us. $20,000, like... So how does each Bitcoin go from 7,000 a day to 20,000 in two years? In my mind, it's, it's all of this coming together. So it's like the happening. If you keep the $400 million inflows into Bitcoin, that pumps it up to, uh, to 14,000 right off the bat or 14,000 and a half, 15,000. Um, it's, it's the investors realize, realizing that you have to hedge, right? That they need to allocate 1% of their portfolio to Bitcoin based on what's happening in the financial markets. It's inflation investors understanding that they need to, to allocate to inflation hedged assets. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, all of that stuff comes together. And again, this wouldn't be crazy. We've, we've hit the end of 2017. We got all the way up to $20,000, right? Yep. On the high side, my, I'm, I'm going to throw this crazy number out there, but it's a hundred thousand dollars and that's a 15 times up 15 X upside, um, in a pretty short period of time. What period of time? Two years. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about that is you're protecting your wealth from, from an inflationary response from the government. Um, so in my, and I mean, in my mind, Bitcoin will be the greatest performing asset over the next 24 months as we not only survive the financial crisis, but we come out of it and, and there's going to be some paradigm shifts. Yeah. And I think any listener right now is going, great. I'll buy Bitcoin today at 7,000. I believe Jason, it's going to be worth a hundred thousand dollars in 2022, but if I want to spend the Bitcoin for the equivalent of $100,000, well, what is $100,000 in 2022 if the Fed keeps doubling its balance sheet every, uh, every, every, you know, six to 12 months? Yep. Yep. Exactly. And <laughs> don't, uh, if, if you do end up buying Bitcoin, I would just say like, this is a, in my mind, this is a binary investment. So like, I, I don't care about the price of Bitcoin going from 7,000 to 3,800, except for that I buy more when it goes down to 3,800. But I don't, but I don't care. I'm not a trader. And I'm assuming most of your listeners aren't traders either. This Bitcoin, in my mind, it's a very binary investment. This thing either goes to zero or this goes to a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. Mm -hmm. So very good guys. Jason Janowitz, founder of Blockworks Group, co-founder. Jason, if you want to learn more about what you're up to, where can they go? Um, our website's blockworksgroup.io. Um, I'm on Twitter. I tweet way too much. I'm way too addicted. It's at Jason Yanowitz. 
And what is Blockworks Group working on? Uh, give, give a little pitch for the company here quick. Yeah, we're an events and media company that helps institutional investors understand blockchain and crypto. Um, we are doubling down on the media side of our business because of the event side is uh, obviously on pause right now. We have 21 podcasts reaching just hit 2 million listeners per month. Um, we have we are um, looking to other media assets such as newsletters, webinars, different websites, stuff like that. But yeah, if you're a podcast listener, which hopefully you are because you're listening to this, we have 2 million listeners a month. I uh, would love to have you join us. Name a podcast they should check out since you have so many. Just pick one. Um, I'll pick two. Okay. Um, I would say Off the Chain is a great podcast if you're interested in... Uh, it's with this guy, Anthony Pompliano. If you're interested in more like traditional financial... Uh, fin- and an and investor is a portfolio manager's take on, on Bitcoin and crypto. If you're, if you want to hear kind of the, some old school stories from the space, we just created a new show six months ago called Untold Stories with Charlie Schramm. There you guys have it. Jason Yanowitz. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nathan.